Hello? You can hear me? That's great. Well, I think we have to start with 11.20. Uh, while you were still sitting, I was just washing my hands in the bathroom a few minutes ago, and the machine, when I moved my hands to the machine, it reacted and started the water, and then I took my hands off and it stopped the water. So do you think it's artificial intelligence or not? That's my question to you. That's a good question, actually. It's, it, it's not related to my talk. I'm just wondering what you guys think. Is it, is it a thinking machine or is it just a, like a calculator which is programmed to do a certain operations? That's, that's a big question. Actually, my friend wrote a book about that. It's going to be published soon where he argues that the artificial intelligence, everything we call now artificial intelligence, is just a collection of algorithms. They're not actually thinking those machines. They're just putting us, giving us water and, and, and taking the water back. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. So my, uh, I will drop a few ideas today for you, just eight of them, how to resolve. That's, that's the summary of everything I'm going to say. I will try to prove you that the more, uh, the more we depend on experts, the more we depend on people who are irreplaceable in our teams, on people who know too much, on people who uh, maintain too much, who possess a lot of knowledge, the bigger the problem for the entire project, the bigger the, the, bigger the danger for the team and for the project. And I want to ask you, the, oh, now I don't see you. That's good. Okay, so my question to you is, who of you actually think that your team depends on you? Can you raise your hand? Even though I don't see your hands. But there are like 20% of you. So the rest of you, the team doesn't need you, right? More or less. They're just paying you. That's why we're here. That's why you're here. Yeah, you're looking for another team. So 20% of you think that think that the team depends on you and you are, and who thinks that you are irreplaceable? That's going to be a really a big problem for the team if they replace you tomorrow. One, two, three, four, five, more. Okay, so I'm, not going, to, I'm going to address my talk to the rest of you guys, how to fight with those people, how to get rid of them. <laughs> and uh, a few words about myself, just quickly. First of all, I'm a CEO and a founder of Xerocracy. It's a, it's a platform which claims to be artificial, artificial intelligence, like, just like those uh, the tap with water in the toilet, but we are managing programmers with artificial intelligence. So we invented the bot, the robot, the computer, who is managing programmers in software projects. The, the robots give instructions to programmers, they collect results, so they more or less help managers and replace managers in software projects. Who of you is interested in that and want to join, you can come to us as a software developer or as a product sponsor, owner, someone who wants to outsource the development work. Second, I am a GitHub active code writer, an open source contributor. This is how many followers I have on GitHub. This is my timeline on GitHub. So I do write codes. So everything I'm going to say today, it's not just fantasizing. I'm actually speaking from my actual experience on, of writing code and working with people who write code. A few of my projects, one is Ruter. It's uh, for DevOps people, for, for open source projects mostly. It helps you uh, deploy your stuff and merge your stuff and um, integrate your stuff from GitHub to production or from GitHub uh, to deployment uh, platform. Check it out. It's interesting stuff. It's also a chatbot on GitHub. Second, it's takes.org. It's a Java web framework, sort of a competitor to Spring and other frameworks. Also interesting because it's more or less pure object-oriented. And cactus.org, it's one of the recent projects we're working on. It's open source also. It's a Java framework for Java library, also object-oriented, focused on object orientation for a replacement of Apache and Google Guava. I'm also a book writer. Maybe some of you know my books, Elegant Objects. Who ever heard or read books, my book, Elegant Objects? One, two, three, four, five. 120 people. So um, <laughs> my, my another, uh, another book, which is also interesting, which I actually spent also some energy into, it's 20, 256 blog hacks. It's about blogging, marketing, staying online and being popular online and attending conferences and making sure 120 people read your books. And this is my last one. It's called Code Ahead, which is a fiction book about IT people, which summarizes almost everything I'm going to say today. So if you haven't heard about that, you may want to check it out. And the last bit of promotion from me, it's my Telegram channel where I post my news and interesting stuff. So you may need to follow it. Who actually in this room use Telegram? Oh, 
less people than read my books. So, <laughs> but I think you should, it's a good platform. And now I'm getting to the point. I'm jumping to the, the main point of my talk. Um, this is the quote I really like from an interesting book. It says that, you can read it, a good way for ineffective people to get power in an organization is actually by creating a monopoly of information. I disagree with this statement only in one piece, and you may guess which that piece is. I disagree that ineffective people do that. I think effective people do that. So in order to be effective, in order to succeed in an organization, in a weak organization, in a not properly disciplined and organized organization, you just create a monopoly of information. You control the territory, you know how things work in that particular area, and then you're the king of that area, and they will not be able to get rid of you. And then you will manage them instead of them managing you. So this is actually... A good principle, even though it sounds like a joke in the book or half joke, I think it's, it's not a joke, it's a problem. It's a problem in the industry, and that problem is called uh, job security. We all know what job security is. It's making sure we are secure at our position. It's not making sure the project is secure. It's not making sure the team is successful. Not making sure the company is successful. It's just making sure that I am safe here. This is my job is secure and they will not be able to replace me, to, you know, to, to, to fire me, to move me somewhere else. And that is good for us programmers, but it's not really good for our projects, for our teams. And I found that term uh, called silos of knowledge. Have you heard about that? Silos of knowledge. Some of you, yeah. Silos of knowledge is like, like those territories I just mentioned, those places which we know about, which I know about, which a few people know about. We know what's going on there. We maintain the information. We're not going to share that information with anyone else because this is our, this is our territory, this is our silo uh, of knowledge. And um, there could be many examples of those silos. I'll give just a few of them. First of all, it's obviously a source code. When uh, I wrote the code, I know how it works. I'm so proud of knowing how it works. And I'm not going to share it with you. Or it will be so difficult for you to understand it anyway. So nobody will want to touch it. And that's my private territory. Second piece, credentials. So I know I have the keys. I have the passwords to the production server. I have the, mm, uh, you know, the information how to log in somewhere. I know how it works. And I have those credentials. I'm not going to share it, or maybe I'll keep them somewhere in the backups, but only I know how to get them out of there, only I know how to apply them, only I know how to manage them. That's another silo of knowledge. This is, this is the slide I'm making up. I didn't find it anywhere. I'm just getting it out of my head. So where exactly people have stuff which they want to keep private and difficult to access. Scripts. I'm talking mostly about deployment scripts, release scripts, packaging scripts, some scripts which are which work sometimes when when the author of the script is taking control of, of the script. But when somebody else touches the script, we don't know how to run it. We don't know how to, to run that script. We don't know what, what parameters are expected. Because the script is fine, but to run it, you need to know the magic, uh, the magic uh, configuration to run that. That's another silo of knowledge. Configuration files, again, for deployment, for, uh, for making sure the software works, we may need some XML, JSON, YAML, you name it, text files to make the code work. And we may keep them secret. And finally, data. How data is organized, for example, in a database? What is the structure of the SQL database? What these tables are, uh, how they are connected and why? What they contain? What kind of information is that? What that column means? One person knows and, and we can get rid of that person because that's, that's the information we possess. Did I miss anything? Any other kind of you know, data or information or knowledge which we share? Maybe, maybe I missed the domain knowledge. When I know how things work in the business, and then I know how to apply that knowledge to the software. And only I understand that connection. So what our customers need when they click that button and what they expect uh, when they go to certain pages. That also may be called the knowledge. Um, the summary is that it's dangerous. When we have those pieces, when we, the project have more and more of those pieces, it's dangerous for the project. And the longer the project works, usually 
the more silos of knowledge we have, the more territories are controlled and protected by their owners. It's dangerous not for us. Again, I have to emphasize it's dangerous for the project. It's dangerous for the team, for the business, for people who pay money to us. Um, so uh, in order to resolve that, in order to... I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the solution now. That was the problem. And now I'm jumping to the solution. In order to resolve that problem, in order to make sure it's not happening, I believe that the best way is to somehow, and I will show you how, to encourage us programmers to share knowledge. So instead of accumulating knowledge, we, want, we need to share the knowledge. And we don't want that because of the job security. We, don't, we want to sit on the knowledge and don't share. So we, the business or the team manager or the project manager or the team altogether has to somehow invent some instruments how to motivate, encourage, force, I don't know, us to share the knowledge. And how do we share? We share in writing, I think. So through documentation, through source code, through explanations, through diagrams, we need to take out the information from our heads and put it into into some digital artifacts, into some files, into some source code, I don't know, in something which is shareable with other people. So instead of uh, knowing how it works, even instead of teaching people around us how it works, we need to write it down. That's the key to success, I think. So we need somehow, and I will show you how, we need to give some, we need to do something in order to, uh, to enforce information sharing. And here's the summary of my suggestion. Um, some sort of a you know, uh, statement slide, that I believe that good programmers, they know how to explain how things work, but the best programmers, they know how to write it, how to put the information, the, the ideas, the, the, the knowledge again, I keep saying the same word again and again, but we, the best people, know how to put that stuff into the digital artifacts, into the documents, into diagrams, whatever. Uh, so if we can turn good programmers into the best programmers. The problem will be solved. So how do we do that? And actually, if we do that, that's, again, one more slide to, um, to say what are we actually achieving with that? Why do we need to do that? Is because we increase the maintainability of the entire code. As we all know, I, I keep giving this number on every conference I speak, is that we programmers change uh, workplaces and, and teams and projects approximately every year. So the recent study by Stack Overflow demonstrated that about 35% of us changed the job during the last year. So let's do, the, let's do the experiment. So can you raise your hand if you actually changed your job in the last calendar year? There you go. So that's maybe not 35%, maybe 20, but still. So we move from project to project approximately. We will move even more frequently. But the project want to stay, you know, stable. The project want to maintain what's in the project, what was created there. So maintainability is a very important uh, characteristic, the very important uh, quality of any project. And if we manage somehow to share knowledge between people before they quit, then the maintainability of the entire stuff will be higher. And actually, I was giving this talk a few a, a months ago in another conference, not this one, but I was touching the same problem, and someone from the, from the room corrected me, improved me, and said that it's not even about maintainability more, but about predictability. That's maybe the better word. So the team will know what's going to happen tomorrow. When we have silos of knowledge, when we have people who know too much, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We simply don't know what are we going to lose and how much we're going to lose when we lose that person. And we may and will lose that person. People go from project to project. It's inevitable. It's not because we're bad programmers, not because we're disloyal, but because this is the market situation right now. I also gave, I'm not giving it now, but I also gave a quote in one of my talks saying that I found it in some article by a recruiter, and there was a claim that if you, according to some research, that if you don't change your job during two years, that means that you're getting 50% less money than you deserve. Something like that. So you have to change every two years. Maybe it's not true. I'm not sure. That's not my, it's not my, you know, I, I, don't, I haven't seen the data. I'm not sure there's data there, but that's what they claim. So now 
like 20 years ago, it was considered like a disloyal behavior if you change companies every few years. Now, this is the professional behavior. You have to move from project to project in order to increase your, 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 your income, and in order to demonstrate that you're moving, that you're improving, and all that. So what will, gonna, what will happen with the project? Where is the predictability? For me, let's say I'm a project manager and I'm an owner of that product. Predictability will suffer if I don't know what's going to happen when you leave. And my final slide before we go into my recommendations. Uh, I, will, I would like to compare what happened, not, com not what happened, but why ancient civilizations, the old guys who lived on this planet that hundreds or thousands of years ago, why they managed to evo um, uh, evolve from, uh, from you know, people who were living in caves to actually builders of beautiful buildings and actually build the civilization. I think that the root uh, uh, cause and the main thing they managed to invent in order to achieve that were actually the ability to transfer knowledge. I think it was like books or something which was written or some, some media in order to transfer knowledge from one generation to another generation. That's why they managed to build beautiful houses. Not because they had brilliant architects and very talented people who knew how to build those, uh, those uh, castles, but because they managed to transfer knowledge from one generation to another one to another one, and then in maybe 15 or 20 or 200 generations, that generation get the knowledge from everybody else and can put something on top and then build something beautiful. A very similar stuff happens to us in our software projects. But our generations are very short now. It's just one year. So I jump into the project, I know how it works, I understand how it works, I build something, and then I quit. So when I quit, I don't want to lose, you don't want, as a project, you don't want to lose everything when I quit. You want to stay with it. So I need to use some media to transfer my, uh, my thinking to you. What media? Source code, documentation, diagrams, data models, something which will be easily understood by you. And what I will suggest to you now, we have eight things we practice in my company in Xerocracy. They may sound quite extreme to you. So they may sound like something which you may not apply in your team, but just listen to them. Listen and maybe something will, uh, will work for you as well. Am I clear up to now? Do you understand the problem? Okay, good. So I will show you eight things and they, they all will prevent experts from, from, from showing up. So we cannot, like, like, like I was joking before, okay, we have some people who we depend on, so let's fire them. This is not a solution, actually, that's too late. So when you already have people who you depend on, we already know that this person knows too much and only that guy understands how the database is designed, that's too late. At that point of time, we need to do something else. The key word here is prevent. We want to prevent that from happening. We don't want people in our team to know too much. We want all of us and the, to know, you know enough to work with the project. And we want the project to be the king, not people, but project. Digital artifacts, not people. The source code is the king, not the software architect. The software architect is just, a, a, you know, is just helping us to make the source code bigger and better and, and more maintainable. So prevent. Step number one is smaller tasks. That's what we recommend to do. Um, uh, we encourage programmers using different methods, different, different ways to work on smaller tasks. Don't keep the code in your hands. Don't keep the problem in your hands for too long. If you're working on something for a week, if you're working on something for a month, you are creating a potential problem because you will know too much about what, we're, what you're working on. So try to return your code, try to return your problem back to the team, back to the source repository as soon as possible. In our team, we ask people to return the stuff back in half an hour, in one hour, no longer. So you start coding, you make a small increment and you return back the code. The smaller the task, the better. And I also, also sometimes claim that professional developers, professional engineers, they know how to solve a bigger problem in smaller increments. So if you don't know how to break your, your bigger chunk of you know, uh, code you need to write into smaller steps, then your professional qualities are not high enough. The more professional you are, 
the more you know how to manage your own complexity, how to manage the complexity of the work at your hands, and how to break it down into pieces. That's the claim number one. Smaller tasks, smaller uh, branches, smaller pull requests, shorter reviews, shorter commits, faster deployments, smaller, smaller, smaller. The longer you keep the job in your hands, the worse. And I had a really, I, I'll give you the real example. I was working in a few years in the team and I, I just joined the team and there was one guy who was quite smart. He was a, like the, the architect, the lead developer. And I happened to be a project manager. I was like leading the team for a short time. And I told him that something has to be done, something has to be implemented. And then he said, sure, no problem. And then I came back, came back to this guy two days later and I was asking like, okay, so what's, what's going on with this situation? And he said, sure, it's done already. I'm doing something else already. So, and, and, and that was considered, he thought that he did a good thing, that he did the right thing. Like, why bother the project manager? Why bother the team with what's going on? He knows what to do. He knows, you know, how to continue. He knows what, what's the next uh, problem to solve. But from my point of view, from the management point of view, that was a complete disaster. It's a completely unmanageable situation. So he did the wrong thing. He had to do a different thing. He had to start what I told him to do and return it back to me as soon as possible. And then, you know, ask for what's the next step. So I want to get the knowledge back from him sooner, faster, not, you know, not, not keep the problem in his hands for too long. I still remember that, that situation. And, and he was arguing with me like, no, I was, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm an independent developer. I know what, what I need to work on. I see the next problem. I can take care of everything. What do we have? If I would be the bad manager, I would let it go. I would say, sure, that's a good situation because it's easy for me. I don't need to manage that guy. He's just keep working and keep working. But in the end, we're going to have the expert who's going to be the problem for me as a project manager. So I have to resolve that problem before it goes too far. I had to say, stop it. It's not going to happen that way. You need to report back to me every, after every small task you finish. Not because I don't trust you, but because I want to see the flow of knowledge back and forth from the code to you and from you to the code. That's number one, and uh, here's the like a subtitle is that I'm talking about hours, not days or weeks. So I'm talking about hours. We don't need to keep the task in the hands of developers for weeks or days. It has to be hours, a few hours here, a few hours there. And it's also the, the great thing for, for the smaller task is that every time you return something back to the source code, we review what you've done. We, the team or code reviewers, we review your stuff and we learn something from what you've done. Step number two is uh, no code ownership. <coughs> you know what code ownership is, right? Many art authors, many books advocate for code ownership, meaning that it's good. So the team has to, you know, or, the, the, or the person or individual person has to own the code and like, you know, attach himself or herself to that code, like feel it like it's mine. I advocate for something completely different. So don't feel that this code is yours. Think like it's something you just hired to touch and improve for a few hours, and then you're supposed to forget that code. So don't attach yourself for too much. Don't marry your code. Feel like it's a temporary stuff in your hands. It's something which you touch, you improve, and then you throw it away. Well, you not throw it away, but you, you, you leave it, and somebody else will touch it. Um, that, will, uh, that will help you understand why it will help in the long run. Because every time, if the, if the, the developer uh, feels like that, if all developers feel like that, if they feel that every time they touch the code, they touch something which is not theirs, they don't be, it's not, it doesn't belong to them, that will help them to behave transactionally. It's every time it's a short transaction. I open the source code, I look at it, I see how I can improve it, I improve it, and then I let it go. So I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I expect new people to come in and blame me for mistakes and ask the questions about what I did and everything else. So if you in your company encourage people to be, you know, owners of the code, you're doing the wrong thing, I believe. So it should be completely the opposite approach. So don't attach yourself to the code. Don't say this code is mine or don't touch my module or who is the author of this module. That is a wrong statement to hear. If you hear that in your office, like who is responsible for that module? Then your team is doing something wrong. Should be nobody responsible for that particular model. It should be the code, share it with everybody, and everybody can modify anything. 
And what we do sometimes, and what I suggest to do, is rotate teams and developers. So in order to not this code ownership to happen, you may take somebody from one team and put into another team and then rotate and then ask people to come in and review the code from another team. So don't, so try not to, uh, to isolate developers with their code or teams uh, staying too tight. It's better to rotate people and move them from team to team intentionally, especially when you feel that somebody is very much attached. Again, I wasn't a real situation a few years ago in the team where we're developing, there was like 30 developers and one person one guy was the author of the payment module, which was responsible, the, the module responsible for credit card transactions. It was like online system and the one piece was for processing payments. It was quite critical because there was a flow of transactions and, and he was, you know, historically the developer of that piece. So he started it a few years ago and he knew how it works. And then the company faced the problem when, when that guy said that I'm going to leave the company because I got a better offer. The company were ready, was ready to pay any amount of money for that guy to stay. And then it was, it was okay for the company, but then everybody else in the team realized that. And I remember like everybody started to talk and say like, what the hell, this guy is just another, well, just the Java developer like I am. So why he's getting a 100% raise? Just because he's sitting on the module, which is more important, I also want to be on that module. So it creates unhealthy and unproductive tense in the team. Because nobody, like I explained, nobody wants to be in that situation if you're not that guy. If you are that guy, it's perfect. But for the rest of the team, that was a really unhealthy situation. Nobody actually understood, were able to understood, was able to understood. I mean, what I'm doing wrong, I'm also, a I mean, I'm a good, honest programmer, I'm writing code, so why the hell my salary is two times slower than the salary of that guy? So what was the mistake? It was the mistake of management. Why the management didn't resolve that before it was too long? The management was just, you know, quiet and, and, and sitting and waiting for that problem to happen. When it happened, it was a disaster. So don't make it happen. Rotate people. If you feel that somebody knows too much, take that person out and put somebody else into, another, into, into that module and see what happens. Uh, tech diversity. I have to say the diversity thing, right? Um, uh, I'm talking about... Uh, having different people in the team with different skills. So when you, that will also help to share knowledge. So if you, if people, they all people are Java developers, they all are experts in that particular framework, they all know how things work in that framework, it's good for some time, it's good for short term. But on the long term, we all know that we're going to lose that people eventually, and that will be quite difficult for new people who may not know how things work specifically in that technology to get into the project. So try to keep, you know, to try to keep diversity in the team by the technology. I'm saying here not by, by skills, not by skin color. So pay attention to the skills people have. If you have, I, I, have a, I had a real like practical experience. Uh, I was, I'm a Java, mostly Java developer. And I remember a project in JavaScript where I was invited by mistake as a code reviewer. So they wanted me to look at the code, and that was JavaScript code. And I started to ask so many questions, stupid questions, of course. They, they, they started to submit me uh, pull requests, and I was supposed to approve them or disapprove. And I was asking questions which are really stupid for JavaScript community. I was asking, like, why are you doing this? And they started to explain me this stuff. And in 50% of explanations, they were just telling me that I should go read the documentation because that's how, you know, things work in the JavaScript world. But in another 50% of questions, I was actually right. I was asking stuff which was not so obvious. And they were asking themselves, like, really, are we doing it right? Because the guy from the Java community thinks it should be done differently. And they were asking, they were challenging themselves by my questions. And that was a good thing. Why did it happen? Because of tech diversity. They, we, I was invited from a completely different tech territory, technical stack, to JavaScript project. Eventually, it happened to be a good thing for the project because of my stupid questions. So try to do it the same. So when you have too many people in the project with the same skills, with exactly the same profile, with exactly the same qualifications, then most likely your project is going the wrong way. Eventually, you will have a problem. Try to invite sometimes people who don't know anything about your tech stack. Uh, point number four, uh, blame them. Uh, now the question is, who is them? So every time uh, 
a problem happens every time we don't know what's going on, every time I look at the code and I don't have enough knowledge in the team. Usually, traditional way is to start asking who knows how it works in the team. Asking around, going around the office, in the Slack chat, in some uh, uh, you know, newsletter, somewhere, asking like, who is the guy to help me out? Who can actually tell me what's going on? And that's wrong. Instead of blaming, instead of finding that guy and blaming that person and saying like, okay, you created that, now tell me how it works. And what, why the hell did you create it that way? Now explain it to me. Okay, they explain, I understand, good, now I am the guy to blame. Instead of that, we should blame artifacts, not programmers. So here, them, I mean digital artifacts. So every time you open something which you don't understand, a database model, a source code, a script. So don't look at the script and, and look at who is the author of the script and start calling that person. Don't do that. Instead, say somewhere where you have your tickets reported in GitHub, in Jira, somewhere where you report problems. Create a new problem, create a bug with the number and say, I don't understand that script. That script is my enemy. Not the person who created that script, but that script is a bad guy. I want to deal with that bad guy. It doesn't matter who created that script. It happened. It happened years ago or days ago. I want that to be fixed. And then the team will find the person to fix the script. And the script will be fixed and the enemy will go away. And now you will have something which is clearer, which is better, which is easier to understand. That's how you increase the maintainability. That's how you improve the project. Not people. That's, that's not how you blame people. Don't never blame people. That's my point. Never blame programmers for writing, uh, you know, for, for creating something unmaintainable and never try to resolve it with them. Never ask them, tell me what's going on, explain it. Always deal with digital artifacts, files, scripts, diagrams, whatever. If they're not good enough for you, claim somehow, ask the management to, you know, to, to, to give you resources to fix them. Uh, well, what we do in our team, how we do, we actually, that could, may sound quite controversial for you, but we pay programmers for each bug they report. So we encourage people financially for reporting bugs. We're telling them, if you open the source code, if you open the file, the class, which is not clear for you, don't blame yourself, first of all, that you don't understand how it works. It's not your fault. Don't blame the author of that. Create a ticket, number one, two, three, and say, I don't understand how file ABC works. I need an explanation. And we're going to pay you for that report. Because that's how you help us to find out where the technical debt is concentrated. Now we know that the problem is right here in this file. Somebody will fix it, and we'll get back to you with the, with the solution. So we encourage financially. I don't know how you can do that. Maybe you can give some, you know, some uh, reward points, some you know, cookies some apples, you know, I don't know. But somehow, I, I think that's the right approach, to encourage programmers to report problems about the code they have in hands. Even about the code they create. So sometimes I open the code, which I created half a year ago, I have no idea how it works, and I create a bug about it. And I pay myself. <laughs> Point number five, we have eight, so I have three more. Point number five is that uh, pay for results. Uh, if we, yeah, there are two, actually two approaches we can, we can, most of us are being paid by the time we work and some of us, very few of us, are being paid by the results we deliver. Paying by results, I mean, if there are no results, we're not being paid. If there are results, we're getting paid. So we advocate the model for pay for results because we believe that if we are being paid for the time we spend in front of the computers, then most likely we will be motivated to create uh, the code, the, the, the artifacts, which are not easy to understand by somebody else. Because we want to stay with our computers. We want to stay with the code for as long as possible. We are internally, subconsciously motivated to be in the team for a long time. We want to be those uh, irreplaceable resources. We want to be those people who are difficult to fire. And especially when the team pays us for, uh, for the time we stay, then we definitely want to, be, uh, want to create something unmaintainable. 
if we turn that upside down and make our con our interaction with the with the with the team more transactional like i give you something you give me the money i contribute i improve i i uh, put my knowledge into your artifacts i actually share my knowledge you give me the money and we walk away uh, we had a real situation but about seven years ago or six years ago we had a project uh, a java project quite big but there was a, an element in it which was supposed to use machine learning and that was like seven years ago. So we didn't know what was that at all. Like we were Java developers and we had no idea what machine learning is. We just read it in the news and we needed to do something. And we had a few frameworks on the Java world for machine learning. And we needed some knowledge to, you know, we needed to know how to apply that stuff to our code. So it was like a big piece of Java and then small element had to be for machine learning. So we found a guy who was the creator of the machine learning framework in Java. I don't even remember the name. Maybe I remember, but it doesn't matter. And I, I emailed that guy. I remember that, that, that situation. I emailed and said, look, we need your knowledge. We don't basically need your code. We don't need to know, you know, we don't need to, you to teach us. We just want you to take your st stuff, which you created, and put it into our code somehow and show us in the code how it has to be wired together with the rest of the stuff. And he said, sure, it's $500 an hour. And that was a good rate so but for for an hour and we hired the guy for i think like for two days or so so we paid good amount of money per hour but we needed just for a small amount of time so we completely bought the knowledge we didn't buy the guy we didn't buy the person we didn't hire the person we didn't need the person we didn't need that person to be in the project we just bought the knowledge and that's what we are trying to do in all other with all other programmers we're not buying time we're buying knowledge the information, the code, the knowledge, the digital, digital something, which we can take, put into the code, and then leave, and, and then let the person go. Of course, we don't let everybody go every day, but that guy, yeah, we let him go in two days. But for other programmers, we are trying to stay together. But every time we consider every transaction, every piece of code you contribute as a transaction, where you give something, the project gives you something back. I'm not sure you can do that in your project, but that's most, pro in my understanding, that's the future of software development. I think in the future, that's my vision for 10 years ago, 10 years ahead, we will have programmers who are actually charging $500 an hour, and we will have programmers who are charging $2 an hour. Now we have more flat distribution. Now we have everybody sitting in the, mostly everybody sitting in their offices or remotely, doesn't matter, and charging something per week, per month, per hour. In the future, I think there will be more diverse distribution of numbers and we will have people who know what they're doing, who can contribute with the good code, good knowledge, and they will charge a lot and we will have everybody else. That's, I think, the future. And I think in the future, I gave that number already in some talks that, that $25,000 a month would be a, a good income for a good programmer, for a professional programmer. But some programmers will get $200 a month. So now we have more, you know, more even distribution in the future, it will be more spread. I think so. Point number six is uh, how we can uh, help people, encourage people to, uh, to give us knowledge and uh, not to keep the knowledge in their heads, is um, read-only ma read master. Who of you, in, in, who, in, 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 raise your hand if in your project, nobody can commit and push to the master branch without a, pri a, pr a preliminary review. That's about five, maybe 10, more, 20. Okay, many of you, that's great actually, because I was asking that question a few years ago in a few conferences and there were just a few hands raised. Now we have more people. So that's, I think, a great instrument for protecting, for, for enforcing the knowledge transfer. If you cannot contribute directly to the master branch, if you cannot push what you know right there in the source code, if you have to pass some code reviews or maybe a number of code reviews. In our case, there are two code reviews. So if you, if you need to do that, if you need to go through uh, quality control or I call it quality gate or quality wall, so there is something standing in front of you which does not allow you to just vote, just uh, freely contribute without telling everybody else, that will help as well. So try to build that quality gate between programmers and the source code and make sure they need to go through something before their knowledge gets into the code, into the source code. If you can manage that, that will be, uh, that will encourage them to be more, to share, to share knowledge better, to share knowledge more effectively. 
because if everybody can just push, you know, without any anybody else looking at what they do, then of course they will stop isolating themselves into their own problems and they will they will, you know, they will go directly to production without telling everybody else. So try to make the life of programmers more difficult. That will make the life of project easier. The more difficult for us is to, you know, to get into the master branches, to put our code there, the better for the maintainability of the project. That's the, the very idea of these quality gates. Uh, we are almost close to the end. We have two more. The most provocative. <laughs> Number seven, no meetings, especially technical ones. Uh, I think, and here you may not agree with me, but try to hear me out. I think that meetings, informal conversations, sitting together in the room, discussing technical stuff is how you degrade your team, is how you become less professional, is how you kill your project. The more you talk, the more informal conversations you have, first of all, the easier it is for you as an engineer because uh, speaking is easier than writing. Like I said before, good, in, good programmers, they know how to talk. The best programmers, they know how to write. So if you cannot put your questions, your ideas, your concerns, your, um, your thinking into writing, into documents, then you are not, you know, you're not as good as you could be. If you can't put your stuff in writing, if you can't ask that questions, in, in, not in the room, but in writing, in diagrams, and then show it to somebody else and get their opinion back from that somebody else, also in writing, that means maintainability, predictability, readability, traceability of everything that happened a year ago, we can have it in, the, in our documents. Very few teams can do that, unfortunately. We are just used to say, hey, Grab your laptop, let's go to the room, and let's talk for two, four hours. Just, you know, let's just get the pizza in. That's not how professional programmers work, I, I believe. This is how we, it looks like we work. But that's immature. That's not professional. We need to find a way how to transfer, how to translate, how to deliver our ideas in writing, in documents. Because, like I said, first of all, it's good for traceability. We will know in the future what ideas we had. Everybody else will know. We will be replaceable. I was at that meeting, and then in half a year, we changed 50% of the team, and nobody remembers what happened at, at that meeting half a year ago. Nobody. We need to start another meeting. We need to talk again. We need to redesign everything or many things. That's not what people who invest in our projects want. We as a team, we as investors, we as key lead engineers want the team to be, want the project to be maintainable. Meaning that in a year, anybody should be able to jump in and understand why that database is designed that way. In order to have that knowledge, the best way is not to read the notes of the meeting or maybe, you know, listen to the, to the audio protocol of the meeting, but actually get more readable documents, uh, you know, something which you may use. I don't know which is going to be. It's up to you. In our case, we use GitHub, just GitHub. GitHub tickets, readme files, markdown documents, and the source code. And that, it seems, for many years already, for a few years, it seems that that's enough. I don't know what's going to be enough for you. And the final one, no chats. That's even more provocative. So we are, in our team, we do not allow programmers to have any chats whatsoever. No Slack, no Telegram. Uh, no heap chat, nothing. All you can do is you have your ticket, and in the ticket you have comments, you post that comments there, you resolve one specific problem inside the ticket, you solve it, we see the solution, you attach your code, you attach your pull request, it all gets in, it gets to the production, done. So we never allow people to discuss what's going on. If you have something to discuss, create a ticket. If you have a solution, submit your solution to the ticket. So no informal conversations. It may sound counterproductive. It may sound like where are the ideas will come from? So where all the creativity will come from? Again, in our projects, it demonstrates that disciplined programmers actually appreciate that approach and they like it. They like that they have, you know, very disciplined and very uh, understandable, clear, predictable way of discussing ideas instead of staying in those chats for, for days and hours and, and talking and talking and talking. So, not at all, I mean it. Try it. I'm not sure. Who of you actually, in, can you raise your hand? Even your team, you have the same situation. Just tickets, just source code, no chats. See? 
So give us a few years and I think that will get into your head, this idea. I think this is again the future of development. I think that, you know, being non-professional, I emphasize that I think it's not professional to use informal communications for technical discussions. I think we can be more professional. We can learn how to write our ideas down. So my final point, I think that we need to transfer knowledge accumulating experts. Those are the bad guys, people who accumulate knowledge. They accumulate knowledge, they know too much, they know how things work, and they are the bad guys. We need to turn to expertise providers, like those guys with the $500 an hour. I'm an expertise provider, I know what you need, I, know, I have the knowledge, I give it to you, and then I walk away. I don't want to stay with the knowledge, I want to drop that knowledge into the source code and forget it. That's how I work personally with my, I have many open source projects, you can check my GitHub. I, I have like maybe 20 actively working projects, like projects who, which actually work and they, people actually contribute to them. And I don't remember what's inside of them. I'm, I can't keep this information in my head because that's too much for me. But I can jump into any of that project and every time I jump in, I create a ticket for myself, I explain what the problem is, I make the changes and I'm trying to forget what, what I've done just now. And I always have this mindset in my, in my head that I will need to forget what I was working on because I don't want to keep it in my head. I want to be expertise provider, not the knowledgeable guy in the project. And my one of the final slides is that the summary. So the best engineers are the easiest to replace. That's what I think. So the easier you are to replace in your team, the easier for the management to get, get, rid, of, get rid of you and put somebody else in your, in your position, the better engineer you are. So that's how we should think. Like, make sure that you are the guy who the team will not need tomorrow. Do it, do it that way, code that way, contribute that way. Make sure that you don't remember anything. You put everything in there, everything in the code. I'm not sure you have to show that to your management though, <laughs> because yeah, it's not gonna be good for job security, but that I think should be the future. Finally, everything I just said, not everything, but most of the thoughts are in my book. Code ahead. So this is what you have to do after listening to my talk. First of all, buy my book. Second, second you can try Xerocracy. If you have your project, you can try how you, our team can actually develop your stuff with all that principles in mind. No meetings, no chats, paying for bugs, contributing with the knowledge, not having any experts. You can try it out. And you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, anywhere. That was it. Thank you very much. You may have questions and we think, I think we still have time. Right? A few minutes, I believe. Any questions? Yeah, you can just say, I'll repeat the question. Uh, number four is, yeah, pay for results. Um, how do I, the question is, how do, I, how do we calculate how much to pay? That's a good question. In our case, it, it's, it's up to you, of course. In our case, I can only say how we do that. In our case, we are putting the very small and very fixed budget on every small micro task. So we are working with micro tasks and we give programmers very small tasks which are estimated approximately with the same estimation. But we managed to achieve that after years of work and years of experiments. In your team, in the team which works in traditional model, that may not be easily achievable. So I would suggest we started a few years ago when we were just starting, we started with estimate. So you're the programmer, I give you the task, but the task has to be small, like really less than a day of work. And then you give me the number of how much you, how many hours or how many dollars you will you know, charge or take for that task. And we can do it like many, many, many times. So when programmers initially, they may not like it because they may sound like uh, a bit too, you know, too, too, maybe too aggressive. But in the end, professional programmers like that, they know that this task is three hours, this task is two hours, this one is one hour, this one is four hour. And in most, peop in most cases, people don't make big mistakes. So it, this, that's how, how we started. But now we are making like really small micro estimates for all tasks. But we are, you know, maybe advanced at this, at this point. Any more? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably related to this ticket. So when we blame artifacts, we create many tickets, or when we work on fixed tickets, then we, then we have many tickets. That's the question. So we have many tickets in the repository. The question is how can we find information there? So instead of maybe it's related to this one, right? 
So we have no meetings, no chats, so we have many tickets, right? That's where people communicate. And the question is, how do we find information there in a few years? So how can we actually... Uh, that's a good question, actually. And uh, I think that uh, I can only say how we do that is uh, GitHub has a pretty powerful search tools. So you can search by keyword, you can search by the name of the class, you can search by the name of the problem, but we still have problems with that. That's true. So sometimes it's difficult to find what was the problem we worked a year ago and how was it solved? I can't find the ticket. In some projects we have 3,000 tickets, 2,000 tickets, and that's a big number for a, quite a small project. And we do sometimes have problems searching and finding, but that's still way better than just saying anybody remembers what was discussed a year ago by what's the name of that guy who left and what's the name of that guy who left? I don't remember what they were discussing. Nobody, oops, nobody knows that. So that's better than looking at the tickets and searching the tickets and finally maybe finding the solution. But I have to admit, finding it's, it's a problem. It's, it may be difficult, yeah. That's a good question. So how do I know if I'm looking at the ticket, how do I know that the information in the ticket is still relevant or was relevant or something like that? I can only answer, how do you know when you look at the, when you cannot, you know, run Docker on some machine and you don't know why it gives you this mistake? You go to, the, to Google, you, you search by the, by the message and then you jump into their GitHub and then you see the GitHub ticket and you see upvotes, downvotes, people, you know, sending these funny emojis. And then you look at this and you read through the whole story and then you find and then you make your own decision whether all this uh, situation, all this information is relevant or not. I don't know. It's not. It's not. A, it's, it's difficult to say exactly what's wrong and what's right. But at least you have the full traceability of what happened there. Who, vo who voted for it? Who voted against it? In our projects, we always have an architect, and an architect has the, the leading the leading voice and the leading role, and the architect can say in the ticket, you know, what's right and what's wrong. But sometimes, again, I have to admit, sometimes it's difficult to say where are we actually able to find the solution, was it actually solved, and what was there. But still, it's better than asking people around, because here you have the full history, which is one, two years old, and you can see, and it's available, most of our projects are open source. You can check them out, you can see our portfolio, and you can jump into GitHub repositories, and you will see all the discussions, like in the open source world. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the first question is, uh, we, if we are paying by results, if we're actually like putting the responsibility of completion to the shoulders of developer, so then how we, how we resolve the problem of uh, the results or the outcome being dependent on somebody else when the, the developer cannot solve the problem because there are some dependencies around? Well, in our case, we just ask developers to put the problem on hold and get back to this problem later. So when you're getting the problem, you're getting the ticket to solve, the job to solve, and you know if you have the fixed budget, but you cannot resolve it because there are some dependencies around, just don't start working on that. Just say, put my problem on hold because you guys gave me something which depends on so many other things. So please solve them, and then I will continue. And then make it the problem of the management. And then the management will see the situation. Okay, we have this task, and we have three more tasks around which are not completed, and that's why this guy cannot continue. Okay, now it's going to be my problem as a manager what to do with this. Maybe I'll give more money to these people. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll say, I'll tell them to focus on resolving that. Maybe I'll do something. But that's, that's not, it shouldn't be the problem of the developer. Yeah, but what, what you just said, it kind of sounds kind of a ping-pong activity between the management and the development because there might be also kind of uh, in the structural, uh, maybe dependency, some, uh, some political gains inside the company. That's true. That's a good question that it may look like ping pong game between developers and managers and that may never end, of course, when you depend on something and they depend on something else and then could be deadlocks. It happens, but in our cases, in our case, in our projects, it happens rarely. And in that case, the management jump in, jumps in or the architect jumps in and somehow resolves that saying that, okay, we're not going to stop working with this or put the highest priority to that. So it's all resolvable case by case.
uh, at the beginning you mentioned that you have a kind of system which uh, requires some artifacts to be to be sent back as as, kind of as the return, uh, maybe to show the progress. What kind of artifacts is acceptable by this system? Well, you know, well, uh, every task, that's again my, my understanding of how software development should work, is that every task, every something, every piece of work we do has to return something back to the repository. Even if it's, but, uh, yeah. But in your concrete case, what do you expect? What is acceptable? Well, we expect, first of all, source code. If you, have to write, if you can write something, it just has to be source code. If you cannot write anything, it has to be a piece of documentation explaining why you cannot write the source code. If it's a script, it has to be a script. It has to be something which may constitute a pull request. So we accept pull requests. We always accept something back in a digital form, which we can put, put in the source code and then let you go. So we never expect you know, talks or discussions or opinions. We always want you to contribute something to the source code. Because like I said in the beginning, we think that it's only healthy to treat developers as knowledge providers, not knowledge accumulators. So every time you give us something, we want actually you to give us something, not to say that you know how it works. But you don't want, we don't want to, we expect you to, you know, not in a, this harsh way, but we expect you to leave tomorrow. We expect you to, we expect to lose you or anybody else tomorrow. And that's why every time you want to completely get out everything you know out of your head and put in the source code from everybody, from me as well. So that's, that's why we expect something digital. In most cases, it's source code, of course. But uh, a pull request means that there should be a comment, and it, which means that there should, there should be some commitment between maybe one party or maybe multiple parties. For example, if I'm, if I'm trying to solve a problem and I need uh, some, uh, some information from the other person, and, and that person only says it to me, it, he doesn't or she, or she doesn't commit anything. How can you refer to this? That's a good question, but I think we need to continue the discussion uh, outside of the room. We definitely should. I think we're running out of time, yeah? For some reason, these guys don't stop me. So uh, thank you very much. I'll see you outside. We can continue the conversation.